and welcome and welcome to the second meeting of the GSA Acquisition Policy Federal Advisory. Uh oh, something. Sorry, advisory um meeting. Sorry, my view it's uh just messed up there. Um, the advisory um committee, also known as GAPFAT, um the Acquisition Workforce um subcommittee meeting. I am Stephanie Hardison and it is my honor to serve as the deputy designated federal officer for this subcommittee, along with the designated federal officer, Boris Aratia. Boris, would you like to share a few words? Yeah, hello everybody. Good to see you all back and uh, looking forward to continuing our conversation today. So it's good to see everybody here and uh, back to you, Stephanie. Okay. We'd like to begin this meeting by thanking everyone and, and please know that your participation is greatly appreciated. We would like to also thank all of those behind the scenes who have helped to bring this meeting together. This is a live virtual public meeting and today's event is being recorded and will be posted to our website with all relevant meeting materials. I'd like to share with our public um, listeners and participants that there will be time for relevant comments and statements towards the end of this meeting. For those who would like to provide comments, comments will be subject to a time limit depending on the number of persons participating today. Um, if you'd like to submit any written comments, please do so through regulations.gov. We will now open the second meeting of the Acquisition Workforce Committee by taking roll. Members of the subcommittee, I will call your name, if you could please take your video um, off mute and say present or identify yourself, I'll begin now. Um, Chairperson, um, Chairperson Daryl Daniels. Present. Co-Chairperson uh, Nicole Darnell. Present. Uh, Gail uh, Bassett. Present. Mark Hayden. David Malone. I'm here. Ann Rong. Here. Steven Schooner. Here. Kristen, Kristen Seaver. Present. Clyde Thompson. Okay. Uh, present. Okay. At this time, I will now turn over to the chairperson, uh, Daniels and co-chair uh, Darnell. We can bring the agenda up at this time if you like. Please do. Okay, so as you see, our agenda today includes some introductory remarks. Um, we have a guest speaker. We have um, a brief discussion around our mission and key priorities that's continued from last week. We'll allow some time for public engagement and uh, we'll have closing remarks and summary. Um, if we take up the full time, great. If we don't, then we'll end as, um, as necessary. Um, we, had a very successful first meeting and, and we, and if any of our committee members were not um, available during our admin chat, we uh, discussed a, a few things around how to move forward. Um, I'd be interested at some point to chat with Boris and Stephanie around some of the activities of the other committee members and the other committees. Um, in fact, we have to put together a framework for moving forward and and making our recommendations. Um, Nicole, do you have any um, additional remarks? I don't, Daryl. I'm just excited to be here and really, really excited to hear from Brennan and uh, what he's going to help us understand today related to uh, education within GSA around federal acquisition and sustainability. Excellent. Then I suggest we. Um, Move right on to our guest speaker. Um, Boris, would you be kind enough to introduce him or sure. you know I, I, a bit more about his background? Yeah, I, I can do that. I had the joy of working with Brennan uh, early on in my career at GSA. So we we come back, uh, go back a long ways. 
Uh, and so um, in the Organizational Office of Policy and Compliance in the Federal Acquisition Service, which is the uh, really uh, the, uh, the staple of acquisition in the federal government. And so Brandon just brings a lot of expertise. Uh, he's worked, um, it, I've always uh, heard his name tied to sustainable acquisition and sustainability. So he's been one of our, our pioneers, I would say, at, at FAST. Uh, so very, very pleased to bring to you uh, Brandon today. And um, without any further ado, Brandon, it's all yours. All right, thanks Boris. I didn't know it was a joy to work with me. I appreciate that. Um, <laughs> so much. Yes. And I don't know if we'll need a full hour unless we have a lot of questions, but i um, happy to go the full hour if, if we want to dig in that much. Um, but yeah, pleasure to be here. I have been involved with sustainable acquisition probably like 13-ish years. Um, I don't think I'm a pioneer because it goes way back before me, but um, I've definitely seen what's what FAST has been doing and been a part of that for a while. So uh, honor to be here. Thanks for having me, uh, especially with this group of subject matter experts. Re really excited uh, to participate and hear what you guys have to offer. Um, also, this got me out of, um, I was power washing my patio, so I got to get out of that to, to present. So that's, that was great. Um, so I'm going to focus on things that uh, FAST is doing to address climate change through our acquisition solutions. Um, I, I presented at the NCMA conference a couple of weeks ago, so I did pull a lot of those, a lot of that content and repurposed it. I think that was pretty much always have the acquisition workforce in mind as the audience uh, industry too, but and, and sometimes it's hard to separate in this topic, but um, a lot of that content is going to be used here. So we can go on to the next slide, please. Um, so I... I think you guys in this uh, subcommittee, uh, oh, thank you, Steve. Oh, Steven presented it, that is, was excellent. A tough act to follow. Um, so yeah, I, I did think it might be helpful. Um, it's helpful for me actually to remind myself of the Federal Acquisition Service and our North Star goals. So basically the goals that we're striving for is set by our, our leadership, which is cre creating tremendous value for our customer's mission, creating a thriving, innovative compliance and um, equitable marketplace and making it dead easy to do business with FAST, which I uh, like that. I like that one the most. Um, so I think sustainability and climate ties into all of those. Uh, you know, sustainability is a key part of a, you know, compliance and equitable marketplace um, in 2023. Um, and making it dead easy. So like things that we can do to incorporate sustainability and climate at the acquisition solution level or at, at the master contract level makes it easy for our customers. So we have to do our job to make sure that stuff's flowing down to our customers. We're making it easy for them to use our tools and, and, and execute at their level. I do like to make it clear, like we can't do everything at the master contract level. There still are responsibilities at the order level um, that customers have to be aware of, but, um, but, but there are a lot that we can do and to, to assist them. So next slide, please. So climate change and uh, sustainability is an administration priority, uh, but there are also other priorities that are, are being uh, worked on to be implemented within the, within the acquisition system. So within FAST, we've been tracking a large number of executive orders. I'm not sure if it was a record. Um, I was not doing the counting, but there were a lot coming. We have a whole executive order tracker where we're looking at everything that impacts acquisition or procurement. Um, and at this point, actually, now we're kind of getting uh, executive orders. A lot of the immediate responsibilities have been executed and completed, and we're kind of getting into the far level. A lot of those executive orders have spawned far cases that are being implemented. Uh, but it's not just climate and sustainability. It covers domestic sourcing, equity, labor, uh, and, and national security is a, is a huge one as well. So all of these are being um incorporated into the acquisition system in addition to the key risks that are already always being addressed, you know, the, the key three, which are performance, price, and delivery. So I, I share this not to point out like, or to, to say that, you know, we we can't do it like it's too much. It's just one on, on a list, but more just to say like, this is one of other priorities, um, being cognizant of the big picture for acquisition, um, opportunities to make it simple for the acquisition workforce, uh, we can't just hand all of these things over the wall and expect them to execute. Um, so 
that is, um, oh, yeah, I also wanted to bring to the attention just um, the acquisition. I'm sure you've heard with the, within the subcommittee that there's a lack of 1102s or there's a, a temporary shortage. We're looking to hire, at least within the Federal Acquisition Service. Um, so a lot is being expected uh, with, you know, ask, asking them to do more with less, essentially. Next slide, please. So with that, uh, let's get into what FAST is doing, and I've categorized it, it this is all in my mind, uh, but I have three categories that I think of. Um, uh, the first is, what can we do to provide a marketplace for the green products and services? So this is kind of the classic sustainable acquisition, you know, the FAR 23 compliance. Um, how do we make sure they're buying the products that they're supposed to or services that the products are being delivered or supplied? Second are steps we're taking within FAST to reduce our suppliers' emissions. So this is greenhouse gas in terms of disclosure, reduction targets. Um, uh, act, so, so a lot of stuff we're kind of rolling out this year for that. And then finally is climate risk. So how do we manage it? You know, um, uh, climate change is happening. Uh, how do we prepare for it and make sure that our acquisition, you know, performance price delivery are not negatively impacted, or at least ready for it. So in terms of um, mitigation and adaptation, these first two categories are what are steps we're taking to reduce our impact, and the third is more adaptive. So with that, let's go to the next slide, and I'll get into, um, oh, thank you, yes, 1102. Sorry if I go into terms and acronyms that I assume everyone knows, 1102 is the acquisition workforce. Thank you, Stephen. Um, so green marketplace. Uh, so, so what can we do to facilitate, you know, the sale of green products and services within GSA? The first thing I'm going to highlight is the green procurement compilation. This is a tool that we manage out of GSA. It basically lets the acquisition workforce go in and type in what they want to buy. And this tells them what the sustainability requirement is. So appliances, if you type it in, it's going to say Energy Star. Um, you know, paper, it's going to say recovered content um, criteria. So this used to be, it, this basically saves them the time of having to search different EPA and USDA, DOE websites, which is what they used to do. Um, I, I think, you know, 15 years ago, there was even like an Excel spreadsheet that was emailed around to the different agencies like, hey, this is the latest list of the green products with the requirement. So at some point, GSA decided it makes sense for us to take this on and on behalf of the government run this website. Um, you know, we don't make money off of it, but it's just a tool that um, is, is valuable and makes sense uh, for, for the acquisition workforce to have. So this is definitely focused on the acquisition workforce. It's tailored to them. Uh, we have started expanding it for vendors. I mean, vendors can use it. Like if you're selling something, this is a great way to know if there is a federal requirement. And uh, last year we did develop a uh, vendor specific aisle for them. But, um, and, and it's also, a, you know, the core thing for me is like them finding out what the requirement is for FAR 23 or executive orders. But as you can see, we have training and um, other things that, that are available on the site too. Uh, next slide, please. Another tool we have, this is managed out of GSA's Office of High Performance Green Buildings, is the Sustainable Facilities Tool Product Search. So this is similar to the green procurement compilation. You know, you can type for what you're looking for, um, but this actually will give you a list of compliant products. So it's not just going to tell you Energy Star. You know, if you search appliance, it's going to give you appliances that actually are Energy Star compliant. So it's not a purchasing tool, so users can't purchase from the SF tool product search, um, but they can get a list of compliant products which they can incorporate into their market research or acquisition planning. Uh, next slide, please. One more tool that I wanted to highlight, or, or in this case, an ordering platform. This is GSA Advantage. I think uh, most folks are probably familiar with this. This is where you can actually go to buy products that are awarded to GSA's multiple awards schedule contract acts, um, some of our blanket purchase agreements and other acquisition vehicles. So we do allow users to search, you know, through the advanced search, or we have an environmental aisle, which is shown here, where they can search by uh, specific environmental programs. Um, 
So, so to me, it makes sense. You know, you would go to the GPC to type out what you're looking for. Um, and then you could, you know, if it turns out it's an appliance, you could select energy star and then look for um, compliant appliances is one way you could do that. Or you could also go through uh, the product search and search by actual like product number. If you see a specific product that you're interested in. Thanks, Steve. Steve, you get a huge assist on this. This is like the third comment. I appreciate that. We did not plan this. Um, so, so those are the three tools I wanted to highlight in the green marketplace category. Uh, one, Boris, um, it's a joy to work with, um, asked me to uh, highlight challenges that, uh, or, or opportunities or things that this group might want to consider focusing on. One area in this space that is a challenge and has been a challenge is accurately identifying compliant products or sustainable products. Uh, when we started, it was kind of the wild west. We've made a lot of great progress. Um, one success we have had was partnering with EPA and some of their programs where they have a qualified list of products with good product information, you know, like UPCs or manufacturing part number. And what we started doing to improve accuracy was we, we ingest that list on a quarterly basis, I think. And uh, we run it through one of our data analytic providers that we have within GSA. Um, so one of the challenges is, you know, you can have a manufacturer enter their product on the EPA list, and then a reseller or the manufacturer could come through the GSA process, you know, uploading their products. And sometimes they don't put the same product information, you know, they might switch a letter or add something. Um, so it makes it hard to figure out that the products are the same. So we have a contractor that manages that for us and has algorithms where they can, you know, make a, uh, uh, within a certain level of confidence determination that the products are the same. So we leverage that process now for Energy Star and Water Sense. We pull the water, the EPA list, and we automatically assign those products on GSA Advantage, and we've seen accuracy go. Uh, it greatly increase. Um, the default approach is just vendor self-designation where they basically check a box when they're uploading the products. So the, the challenge right now is I think, you know, we've uh, implemented this for all the programs that have a list, uh, but we're trying to make progress for the ones that don't. Uh, right now, we're specifically partnering with the Safer Choice program. They've been great. Um, they have a, a, a decent list, but um, uh, it's it's not quite up to the the level of Energy Star in terms of accuracy. Also, they use a different um, coding process where they have UPCs, which we don't have for all of our products. Um, so the approach we're pursuing right now with them as kind of a pilot is to um, use something that GSA just stood up a year ago called the Verified Products Portal. It's basically our um, our catalog management office runs it where we partner directly with manufacturers to get their product information into the verified products portal. Um, uh, so this, this is important for, you know, determining which products are, which um, GSA contractors are authorized to sell our products. That's one of the big key reasons that we have the verified products portal. It also reduces counterfeit or risky products. Um, we partnered with them to a couple of years ago, add some sustainability fields so that manufacturers could add those. Um, uh, like if it's safer choice, they could actually, the manufacturer themselves could list that and we could pull that into our data eco ecosystem. Um, so right now what we're doing with safer choice is we're pitching there and they're working on getting their manufacturers to go into their verified products portal Um you know, click all the products that they have and show that they're designated and that can flow down into Advantage. Um, we haven't quite got the results of how effective that is, um, but that's an approach that we're aggressively pursuing right now. Hopefully that made sense. Uh, <laughs> verified product portal. Um, okay, so I'll pause there and I, I understand there'll be Q&A. So if anyone wants to dig into this, uh, happy to talk about it more. So next slide, please. And uh, now we're moving away from the first category to the second and third, uh, which is reducing supplier emissions and also managing climate risk. So this this is, um, I don't want to say new, I guess compared to some of the FAR 23 stuff it is, but um, 
basically FAST has been prioritizing uh, reducing supplier emissions and managing climate risks in our uh, major acquisition vehicles. Uh, specifically, we have a federal uh, uh, a contract review process for any of our major acquisition vehicles. So anything that's government wide over you know $100 million in uh, you know, expected volume uh, goes through a process you know, at the market research, acquisition planning, uh, pre-solicitation phase, um, and there's also post-award reviews as well. Um, and what we're doing is leveraging that process to incorporate GHG reduction requirements and climate risk requirements. Um, so the benefits of these, uh, I don't, probably don't have to tell this group, I think you guys know, but you know, we're working towards the net zero procurement goal that uh, you know, was established by the executive order. Um, as I said earlier about making it dead easy, uh, you know, steps that we take at the acquisition solution level can help reduce scope three emissions. Basically, like if our vendors are reducing our emissions, you know, if you order through us and our vendors are reducing our emissions, you're automatically reducing your scope three emissions. So that's the make it e make a dead easy pitch. Um, there's increased efficiencies associated with this is what a lot of folks in industry say after they've gone through, um, you know, conducting a GHG inventory and disclosing. Uh, reducing the negative impacts of climate risks. So this is, you know, performance price delivery, um, all impacted by climate change. So by managing climate risk, we can reduce those impacts. And then finally, there's also a, a, a p element of this, um, at least for the greenhouse gas requirements, where we're getting them to, we're getting our contractor, our industry base to, um, you know, conduct an inventory, start disclosing, set target reductions. This is getting us out ahead of the FAR case that's um, out for comment right now, um, basically preparing them for, for when that goes effective. So next slide, please. Let's talk about what we're actually starting to do this year. Um, actually, we've been doing it longer this year. Um, so reducing supplier emissions. Uh, I don't know why I said we just started doing this this year. We did this, we started doing this in 2016. Um, uh, Alliant 2 was basically the pilot for this led by uh, Jed Ela out of, um, actually he was FAST at the time, but Office of Government Wide Policy. So basically this approach entails um, requiring, um, oh, it's funny, I can't see the bottom of the slide. Basically requiring uh, vendors as a post-award deliverable to give us uh, their, to conduct a GHG inventory, scope one and two emissions, um, you know, a year, two years after contract award. Also set a reduction target. So, you know, I plan to reduce by X percent within X years and then report out on their progress towards that target over the life of the contract. So can keep conducting those inventories and then reporting out to GSA um, you know, what progress they're making. So, as I said, this approach was piloted under Alliant 2. Um, it was successful. Uh, we've been pulling a lot of uh, lessons learned from Jed and his team, and we've incorporated this into a number of different um, acquisitions. I think only one or two have actually uh, been awarded, but there are several that are in the solicitation phase um, or pre-solicitation phase. So this is something that we're obviously expanding out to a lot of our major acquisition vehicles. Hey, Brennan, uh, real quick, could you just to level set the group, just very briefly talk about scope one, two, and three, just, you know, the, the top the top line without going too far. And then also a little bit about Alliant, just a little bit, just to level set. Okay. Yeah. Um, so, I can never remember these off the top of my head, but uh, scope one and two are basically the emissions that you uh, generate on site at your facility. So, you know, your boilers, all the energy to heat, or that you purchase uh, to uh, generate on your site. Uh, garble that a little bit, but that's generally basically what you generate or buy. And then scope three is everything else. So, that's your really supply chain emissions. So, um, you know, if you purchase uh, equipment, you know, there's uh, emissions associated with that equipment that is attributed to your scope three footprint. Uh, Alliant 2 is a big IT contract that GSA manages. Um, it's a GWAC 
um, GWAX or IT contracts. So um, roughly 50 or so. Um, but, oh, thanks, Melissa. Melissa works with me, bailing me out. <laughs> yeah, they're, they're, that's a better explanation of the scopes. Um, Alliant 2 is just a big GSA IT contract. So I think that's all you need to know. But the uh, one key, uh, I did get a question about this at NCMA, like this requirement could be done for any, it doesn't matter what you're purchasing, right? Because we're targeting the vendor's emissions. So it doesn't matter what they're selling, what they're doing. It's, it's you know, the vendor um, scope one and two and with three optional. So key point there. Right. Thank Go you, to the sir. next slide. Yeah, thank you. Another uh, approach we're taking uh, tentatively, actually, I think this was just incorporated into a recent acquisition that was, or a, a draft solicitation actually, but um, is to award offers um, points in the pre-award evaluation phase for certain achievements uh, associated with their greenhouse gases and other sustainability achievements. So. Uh, for this particular example, there was one point available for offers that can demonstrate that they've publicly disclosed their scope one and two emissions. And then there's a second point uh, if for you know higher levels of achievement, whether that's publicly disclosing their scope three. And scope three is harder. That's why it's a it's harder and generally I think it's where more of the emissions are. So that's why it's a, a more uh, robust achievement. Uh, second is publicly as well as disclosing a science-based reduction target, and then in this case, a certification to a multi-attribute standard. In this case, it's ANSI 3911, which is um, was developed for professional service providers. So this is something we're looking at. I think uh, to contrast this with the previous slide, uh, post-award deliverables are, uh, I think, less risky from an acquisition perspective, um, just because you're not evaluating it's like they're already awarded they're not going to protest you know because they've been awarded the contract and then you're getting it as post-award reports um uh evaluation factors not that they're significant significantly risky but i think there's been um uh this hasn't been done widely i think because it wasn't necessarily clear like what those points could be so these are fairly, I think, um, black and white, don't require a lot of um, subjective evaluation. Um, but uh, again, new approach that we're, we're starting to take for some of our acquisition vehicles. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so this is our the last category I wanted to touch on, uh, specifically with managing climate risk. So again, this is adaptive. Um, you know, recognizing that climate change is going to impact uh, everything, including our acquisitions and our vendors' performance. So we're actually taking what is kind of a similar approach to the post-award greenhouse gas disclosure and target setting um, uh, uh, strategy. But instead of the disclosure of greenhouse gases, this is focused on climate risk. So we're asking any of our awardees or requiring rather uh, to submit a plan, you know, one or two or whatever time period the contracting officer chooses um, after award, send us a plan uh, for how you're going to manage climate risk. So some vendors already have this, um, this content that we have here, like we, we do provide specific questions, but um, uh, in those questions that we developed were pulled from uh, or very similar to content that's asked from the Carbon Disclosure Project or CDP. Uh, so we're definitely working to align. By the way, let me take a step back. Uh, for all of this, we are working to align what we're asking for with what um, uh, is out there in the commercial marketplace already. So CDP is the big one. Uh, anything that we're asking, we were trying to align there so that vendors that are already doing or responding or disclosing aren't having to do something new. Like if they've already done it, in a lot of cases, they can just send us what they've already developed or submitted. Um, so it reduces, you know, we, we're trying to avoid government unique requirements is what I'm trying to say. So anyway, uh, so for climate risk, uh, basically we're asking them year or two after award, what's your process for identifying, assessing, responding to climate related risks? What 
major risks have you identified that could have an impact on your business? And three, what is your business continuity plan? So pretty simple. Uh, really, the goal here uh, is to get them thinking about it. Uh, I think for a lot of vendors, well, I don't know the numbers, but this isn't even on the radar for many folks. So this is a way to, over time, get our vendors to be considering this and taking action. So after that initial report uh, that they, you know, answering these questions later, a subsequent deliverable that they provide to us is about action that they've taken or opportunities that they've identified to manage the climate risk. So uh, next slide, please. I don't know, that might be the last slide. No, oh, I got plenty of slides left. Um, so that's a good overview, I think, hopefully a good overview of the three categories that we're taking. I did think it might be helpful to really quickly walk through uh, what we're looking at. Uh, we have the spreadsheet of all the priorities we're working on this year. So maybe this will be helpful um, for FY23 within our office, FAST Office of Policy and Compliance. Major on our radar is just actually providing direct acquisition support. So for those acquisitions, particularly the ones going through that FAC process, the, the advisory board, we're looking to continue partnering with those acquisition teams to integrate the greenhouse gas and climate risk requirements in new major FAST acquisitions. Also, we're looking for the ones that have integrated it and that are going to be getting those reports. We're working to support them. Like, how do they administer that? Um, you know, what does that actually look like? You know, is it a Google survey that they ask? Do you know, you, are they getting these like PDFs that they have to go and go through? We're trying to think through that process um, to scale and streamlining that as much as we can. Again, going back to what I said earlier about 1102s, you know, being asked to do more with less, we're trying to get ahead of, out ahead of that as much as we can to make sure that they can execute these requirements um, well and that it's not taking up, you know, we need to free them up to do other things. Another major initiative is, um, and I haven't touched on this, but last year we, within FAS, GSA has been doing this for years, we just voluntarily, we invite our major suppliers to voluntarily disclose to CDP, which formerly the Carbon Disclosure Project. So it's not tied to any specific contract. I mean, they are all contractors, but we really just say, hey, we think it would be great if you disclose your greenhouse gas emissions and your climate risk to CDP. Uh, this is important to us. You know, here's all the reasons why, but, you know, please do it. And a lot of them do it. So we started, um, we realized that we had, you know, o OGP manages this process, but, you know, we talked to them. We're like, hey, could we ask some of our contractors to do it? And they're like, of course. So we did that. And I think we had like 40, 45 of our contractors take us up on the offer. So we're going to keep doing that you know, prioritizing um, by, by sales and climate impacts, which contractors we invite. Uh, third, we're going to develop, well, we've actually primarily, we've pretty much developed it, uh, but we're going to work to roll out federal-wide climate and sustainability training for the acquisition workforce. Um, there was a uh, training that was out there. So we basically took what we had, you know, back in 2015-ish and updated that with all the new requirements, all the developments that have occurred since that time uh, and, and get that out for the workforce. I haven't talked about training much, but um, this obviously ties into that. I think it is a key component of, you know, supporting the acquisition workforce. Um, maybe we can talk about that if anyone has questions. We, we, we have been saying a lot that um, we can't train our way out of this, uh, issue, um, but that doesn't mean training isn't a significant component. Fourth, developing a supplier climate risk plan template. So we have a couple questions we say they can answer, but we're trying to uh, formalize and structure that a little bit more. Uh, this is probably more for the industry side, but getting them uh, something that they can work from, make it easier for them. But I guess there probably is a workforce component there too, because if we do have a template, then that can structure what we're receiving on the back end for uh, contract administration purposes. Fifth, uh, this is FAST specific. We're going to continue leading an internal FAST sustainability work group that we have. So we meet every month with representatives from the different acquisition centers within FAST. Uh, 
really the goal of that is to make sure they're aware of everything that's going on with regarding sustainability and climate, but also to build subject matter expertise. Um, the idea is that if we can have an expert in every acquisition center that can support their acquisition teams, then uh, then that's that's a good thing. Uh, we actually have we're, we're modeling this after a, a uh, cyber supply chain risk working group that took a similar um, approach. They call themselves scrim champs. So these are like climate champs, I guess you could call them. So we're continuing to to push that as, as a model. Uh, next, update the green procurement compilation. There are a lot of things we expect to come through uh, with a potential FAR 23 um, FAR case uh, that will be issued, executive orders, developments regarding you know, new issues like PFAS, plastic reduction, uh, anything that the workforce needs to know in terms of you know, that searching for you know, what do I need to consider when I'm purchasing. And then going back to the... Uh, environmental product designation issue, continue working with the verified products portal to, to monitor effectiveness and, you know, course correct as needed, see if we can make progress. So, th th and that's not all, there, there's so many other things that we're doing, but uh, those are the big ones that I thought I would highlight. So uh, it's actually making my heart uh, race a little bit, just looking at all the stuff that we said we're going to do. So um, next slide, please. This is the last one, I promise. Um, uh, and I actually just came up with this before the call, uh, potential challenges. Hopefully whatever I presented on, you guys can figure out what challenges you think uh, make sense. But I, I took a shot, um, first being what actions can GSA take to better identify green products? I actually talked about this a little bit. So uh, that is such a, a tough issue. Um, we would probably need several hours to really walk through use cases and all the issues with that. Um, but it, it is just like a sticky issue that I've seen um, for the past 10 years. So what actions can we take to better identify green products for our customers? Two, um, prioritizing. So what can GSA do? Um, I didn't, I miss, didn't write that, did I? What can GSA do to encourage acquisition teams to prioritize sustainability and implement innovative approaches. So uh, I, I think I put this one in here, like we're pushing it, like the fact that the advisory board process has been really effective. Uh, we have senior leadership buy-in on this, which I think is critical for it working for GSA and for FAST. Um, but it does feel kind of like we're having to push um, some of these vendor supplier and climate risk uh, requirements. Um, there, there was actually a uh, acquisition letter a policy issued out of OGP encouraging acquisition teams to implement innovative approaches. We have seen some of it, but um, uh, it's, I guess this one would be like, what can we do to see a bubble up from the different acquisition teams instead of maybe kind of a top-down approach? Um, just a thought. And then finally, maturing, what are the next steps for GSA to move up the supply chain risk management maturity curve? Um, so for climate risk, I walked through that plan that we're requiring. Uh, I, I think I failed to mention, I should have mentioned at the time, like supply chain climate risk management is, is I don't wanna say it's new, but it's emerging, it's tough, it's a complex thing. Uh, you know, these requiring plans from, our contractors, I think, is a good process that makes sense now. But what what do we want to be doing five or ten years from now? Like, what does an effective climate risk management process look like, and how do we implement it through our acquisition solutions? Like, I don't think we want to just continuing continue to ask our vendors for plans in perpetuity. I think there's you know there there's something else we can do better. So that, that might be a helpful thing for this group to, to weigh in on. But with that, um, that's all I have. So I think we can probably move to the Q&A session at this point. Wow, that was really informative. Um, I appreciate that presentation very much. I know I have a ton of questions, but I'm not going to take up all the time with my questions. However, Brennan, I would like to ask, um, 
I got the sense that there was a great deal of focus, of course, with um, the acquisition professional. But what about the program managers? Um, did you con are they considered part of the team? And I'm talking about the 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 project folk who actually have something that they're trying to execute or procure. I often find that. They, they, there's this resistance when it comes to the procurement people or anybody who's evaluating anything. And as kind of a project person, um, you look at them and like, oh, yeah, guys, you guys keep putting all these requirements on me and I, I can't get the project done and blah, blah, blah. You know, how do you, how do you change? I mean, how are we looking to change the mindset of that group of uh, professionals who are trying to execute thing and not see this as a, as a barrier? I hate to say it that way, but it's true. <laughs> yeah, no, that's helpful. Uh, I tried to use the term acquisition team because in my right. mind it includes both, but you're right. That is a specific point and an issue that I've heard raised for a long time. Like who's required is the program folk that a person that has the requirement and doesn't specify anything about sustainability or climate, or is it the CO? Um, I mean, I think, the CO at least had probably is on the hook for some compliance piece of that, you know, in terms of making sure FAR 23 is complied with, but in terms of innovative approaches or, or sustainability goals, I, it's you, both of them, I guess, are, are required. So um, I'm not sure, Daryl, about the interaction you've heard about, you know, who's pointing fingers or who's holding things up. Um, but that is a dynamic that I have have heard and and both are both are, both are on the hook i think yeah I, I see it across the government i see it across the government in in various um approaches to procurement or evaluating you know some system or that the that the program managers often uh stumble up against or or or, or feel like there's just some barrier mm -hmm. uh them achieving their goals um and i'm sure we could talk more about that but i want to open up for the committee to ask any questions and I, I think uh david was up was that first yeah david oh i'm oh. sorry yeah yeah david um uh, hi brennan uh great work i'm actually pleasantly surprised at the actions that you're already taking with uh, the acquisition workforce so that's great on the requirements that you have for the contractors and suppliers and so forth, are they given credit for good faith efforts or is there a goal that you set? It sounds like the KPIs aren't in place, but I'm just curious about that. And if you have a goal for each of the requirements that you give them, are you accepting good faith efforts? Thanks, David. Um... Yeah, so those, I, th I think the full text of that um, for the greenhouse gas emission disclosure first, I think the teeth there is that they'll be reported out in CPARs. So I think we do include um, some language about identifying any barriers to implementation. That might be for the climate risk one. Um, so yeah, I, I think the only, the teeth that we had for that was CPARs reporting in terms of timely and complete uh, submission. Um, so for the pre-award, uh, the point system, I think we had, it was all self-attestation. So that's either you get the point or you don't. So good faith effort wouldn't apply for, for that one. Yeah. Um, just one other question, a follow-up to that. What would you want from this committee? I know you listed three areas that we could focus on, but if you could nail it down to narrow it down to one, you know, we're we're corporate and we're here to help, so to speak, right? So what <laughs> what is that one thing that you would say, hey, if we could figure this out, we could make a lot of headway here? David, it's hard. I was I was having a hard time coming up with three things because for some of these, like the the environmental product thing, it's such a sticky problem with so many stakeholders and so, so many. Like I don't see a silver bullet for any of those. Um, for that one in particular, for the acquisition workforce, um, 
I, I guess to me, it would probably be the third one I flagged with the climate risk. Like, what does that look like moving forward? Like, I think we've kind of started the process, but I haven't heard anything like, what's our plan? Like, I remember for our cyber supply chain risk management, we had an executive come in and set up like a maturity model. She's like, right now we're at one. We want to get to five or six or seven. And to do that, here's what it you know, the maturity model is kind of broad, but, you know, we're now at a three and uh, a lot of that has just been like through building expertise, building tools and processes, piloting things. Um, so I feel like if climate risk is going to take off, it needs um, it, it needs that kind of uh, attention. That being said, like if you, this group may have heard things that, you know, they, I, I'm completely open to what you guys want to suggest as well. Thanks, Brennan. Yeah, thank you. Um, and then Nicole. Yeah, thank you, Brennan. Um, when a supplier submits a, a climate risk plan, what role does the, I, I presume the core or the procurement specialist is reviewing that plan? How do they have the expertise or knowledge to know whether that's the right plan? Like, I appreciate you have a template, but how do they review and analyze that content given they're not experts in sustainability or climate issues? Yes, great question, Ann. Uh, and, and we haven't done it yet for that specific requirement because none of, we haven't actually received the report. So we're um, working through what that looks like right now in terms of like, how do you receive it and all that. But uh, in terms of like, we're not looking at the plan to evaluate and say if it's a good plan or not. So I think there is, I think the minimum requirement is that it's responsive, right? Like you have to meet our requirements, but we, yeah, you're right. We don't have the expertise to come in. I think the goal of the plan is to one, get the vendor on the path of even considering and starting to manage this risk. That's one benefit Two. I think the information that we can, we're planning on collecting, aggregating that information and starting to learn. So we're not just asking our vendors, like eventually if we have a couple IT acquisitions, for example, where we see this, we can say, okay, we're starting to see some key risks here. That's information that could be leveraged at the category level. Like we shouldn't have to have this done by every CO. Like if you're buying the same thing, the same, I mean, it's kind of regionally based for climate risk, but you know, hopefully we can start pushing that up to the category level in my mind um, and start using that. Like GSA, we have our own risk plan. We do our own vulnerability assessments and it's at such a high level right now. Like I think a category that we look at is just like supply chains, but I'm like, that's so broad. What do we do with that? But if we can start getting actionable information then, or more specific information, then it might be more actionable. So I don't, yeah. I don't does that answer your question, Ann? Oh, it's a tough one. Yeah, I'm, I'm wondering if the category managers and their teams can play a role. But um, thank you. I have additional questions, but I want to I want to let everyone have an opportunity to ask you questions. And I can submit something in writing later, Brennan, if I don't get a chance to follow up. Hey, Nicole. Yep. Thanks, Joe. Thanks, Brennan. That was a really great presentation. I have, like the other folks, lots and lots of questions, but I'm going to just start off with one big bucket, and this relates to automation. Um, and thinking about the really low-hanging fruit where we can have the biggest impact for the broadest number of individuals within the acquisition workforce. So I'm curious about, because you've been at this a long time, what are the opportunities for automation, either structural or administrative solutions that would really make sustainable acquisition part of the default? And by that, I mean the green procurement compilation. Is green the default in current, uh, in current acquisition decisions? Is this something that your team has thought about? Similarly, thinking about requiring RFPs to include sustainability language before getting clearance to go into SAM.gov. Can you offer us some suggestions or some thoughts about ways in which we can automate to have the biggest, the biggest punch in what this committee is trying to do right now? 
Yes. Uh, <laughs> <clears throat> so I, as you talked, a bunch of different stuff was popping in my mind. So sorry if I get lost. One, uh, the first thing I thought of was uh, the Federal Procurement Data System, FPDS, is very limited in its sustainability reporting. I think it has three fields that you can select. I think it's like recycled content, bio-based, and then environmentally preferable. But it just applies at the contract level. So it's like if you buy one thing with it, you check the box. Like uh, this has been an issue for a while, I think, where it's hard to just even track like what track what we're buying through that system, at least. Um, so we're trying to leverage other sources of data, either through GSA Advantage and you know transactional data reporting requirements. Um, so I think changing that would be great um, in terms of automating things. Um, uh, oh man, I lost it now. Um, oh, okay. A contract writing systems is another opportunity. Uh, so uh, Calm is the one that is being rolled out within GSA, but other other agencies I think use like Prism and some other ones. So I think we worked on. And, and this was an EPA led, I think, and DOE led initiative that we kind of partnered with trying to incorporate it. So like, oh, if you buy this NAICS code or PSC, you get an automatic flag, like this should include this and this and this. Um, that didn't get off the ground, but that was a promising opportunity that could be revisited. Uh, so that could help increase compliance. Um, I had another one, Nicole, I can't remember. Um, did you... Can, can you repeat any of that? Um, I don't know if I fully addressed what you were asking, but those are two. I'll, I'll offer actually a couple of other examples I'm worrying about. So the green procurement compilation, how is uh -huh. it invoked as the default and requiring RFPs to include sustainability language before ever getting clearance to go into SAM.gov. I'm also wondering about integrating SF tool into the green procurement compilation. Like what, how are there ways that we could make mm -hmm this process easier for the acquisition workforce? Yes. Um, so first of all, what I think uh, if for the acquisitions themselves, like, like I, and I don't know this, but you can include the clause in the solicitation, but one question is, is it being enforced on the back end? Mm -hmm. um, so contract administration, I think plays a role there. Like, are we actually ensuring and I think a lot of this stuff is being procured through service or solution type contracts. I mean, people, you know, we have some volume going through GSA Advantage of products directly, but I think the bulk of, and I don't have numbers to this, but I think a lot of the products are being delivered, supplied, or used as part of a, a service. So are those being uh, enforced? In terms of incorporate, yeah, I think you picked up on something key, which... Um, I may have even mentioned this in a previous presentation was, yeah, I went through those three tools like GSA Advantage, Product Search, and GPC, which are great, but functionally they should be combined, right? Like where you just find the product and it's there. So I uh, so I, I think, and you're saying make it the default. Uh, what do you mean by default, I guess, Nicole? So that the green products are the ones that pop up first. Yeah. Right. It becomes harder to find the products that are less sustainable. Mm -hmm. Right now, yeah. it's harder to find the products that are sustainable. Yeah, I think there's opportunity for that for GSA Advantage. And I don't know how GSA Advantage ranks things um, or other platforms like, you know, customers purchasing through e-commerce platforms. Um, I, don't, I don't know the extent to which sustainability is the default. Um, but yes, I, I see that as an opportunity if that was your question. Yeah, for sure. Thank you. Any other questions from um, um, committee members? Uh, we've not heard from. Steve has had a number of questions in the chat. Maybe this is a moment for him to ask them in, in real time. Sure. Uh, my feeling is as long as Ann and Nicole have more questions, uh, they should keep going. But obviously, I have plenty if they want to defer. Oh, no, We'd like no, to hear I from to, all our I communities. Have an opportunity. 
Yeah. Okay. So, so Brennan, I've been typing them in there, but uh, yeah. my first macro level question is uh, basically FAI, and is there any chance of getting this to someday be a core competency? Because until it's a core competency, the message to the 1102 communities is it's not important. So, and then I think the same thing comes up with the point Nicole was making about FPDS and SAM. If you have a hundred data fields and this isn't one of them, how important is it to the government, right? If you make this a data field, all of a sudden the game changes dramatically. Uh, so, I mean, I think those are two easy ones to start. I will say that we're actually hoping in our subcommittee to also uh, at least get GSA to consider having federal supply schedule users to basically have to choose from the environmental aisle or do a DNF. Why not? So again, that's a pretty soft mandate. It's what the behavioral economics economists would call a nudge, right? We're not telling you you can't buy the, 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 the inefficient product. We're just saying that shop on the environmental aisle and it's easier and faster. And in fact, that's the way the federal supply schedule grew in our lifetime anyway, right? By far part eight, you make it easier than everything else. Well, let's make the environmental aisle easier than everything else. But in any event, thanks again for joining us. Yeah, thanks, Steve. Uh, I, I don't know if that was even a question. I agree. Um, what, what was your first comment about? I, I was going to comment on that. Was it FPDS? Oh, the, the, the first was more FAI. FAI. So oh, okay, what, yeah. I, what I heard you saying is the GSA was taking on itself the training burden. And it seems to me that FAI has started, but they're moving too slow. DAU is moving even more slowly. But if somebody convinced FAI to make this a core competency so that a year from now, people had to actually be able to define 10 words in order to get their FACSI certification, the learning curve would flatten pretty darn fast. Right, right. Yes, I agree with that. Uh, yeah, we're and, and our goal within FAST is to have that training out. Uh, it's taking longer than we were hoping and then to make it a requirement, at least for FAST. But uh, definitely agree it should be federal wide. I think I heard the uh, sustainability trainings are the most popular. Someone told me they're the most popular ones when they're out there. So um, that's good to at least see that level of interest. Um, so, yeah, and I agree, Steve. Um, yeah, everything you said, I support. Yeah. So for advantage, I guess your point was advantage, make it the default uh you know buy that first i mean that is kind of a frustrating point here is like far 23 like it is a requirement like they're supposed to purchase it but i guess your point is by adjusting our tools and to make it like the default any i agree i support anything to do that if you guys have recommendations on what that looks like um that that would actually be very very much welcome Great, we should definitely put that on our list. I see Boris's hand up. Hey, hey Brennan, uh, not so much of a question, but I think uh, for context for this group, it would be really helpful if you can talk a little bit about the GSA or the fast acquisition workforce, a little bit the size about how many contracting officers we have a fast and just a little, just a little bit of a uh, lay of the land, you know, in terms of our, our acquisition workforce. So, so the committee understands the population that, that you're talking about. So we got, you know, FAST has 4,000 employees. Uh, about a quarter of those are contracting officers, approximately. Hey, hey, you keep going. You know more than I do. Uh, yeah, yeah. No, but but I think, you know, I think that would be helpful for this group to hear a little bit of the lay of the land for, for who we're talking about. Yeah. Okay. I don't know the numbers, Boris. Um, so I'm not sure. I mean, in terms of how we're structured, we have, you know, acquisition teams, we have, multiple awards schedule 1102 so CEO is a lot of contract specialists that support that um, we have assisted acquisitions which are doing purchases on behalf of other uh, agencies we have global supply um, that actually has, does have implications for sustainable purchasing because they deal with national stock numbers where environmental attributes are assigned uh, somewhat more accurate generally um, uh, so yeah, Boris, if you have anything to add, go for it. No, I, I think that's good. I think I just wanted them to see, like you mentioned CPARs earlier too. And just, can you talk, right, talk a little yeah. about CPARs? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. CPARs is just their past performance review system. So um, in that context, I was talking about if they don't, 
Well, I mean, I guess the, in, in terms of that post award requirement, you know, they have corrective actions they can take if they're not compliant with that. But the point was like putting the their responsiveness into CPARS was was the main hook that we listed in the contract language. Okay. All right. Thank you. All right. We have hey, more Brandon. questions. Yeah, I had a, another question around. Um, you mentioned, you know, you, GSA has sought voluntary disclosure of certain environmental standards from major GSA contractors. And I get that part of that is defined by the amount of spend every year, but you also alluded to their impact on the climate. How do you assess major contractor in terms of its impact on the climate? Are you focused on certain categories? Yeah, I, I, we were just, I mentioned that as like, we are prioritizing sales. We're not assessing their impact, but using sales ah. as a proxy for impact, which I know is not ac necessarily accurate because, you know, like a professional service provider is going to have a much lower impact than other contractors. So, right. so right. yeah, so for that, and it's just disclosure based on sales. Um, that being said, like we uh, are looking at ways to prioritize based on impact. Uh, we have actually done that before. Like you can do use uh, life cycle analysis to kind of prioritize generally speaking at a high level and determine if uh, based on categories, which contractors are the most intensive um, with their impacts. Yeah, I'm intrigued with this idea of hotspots, either by suppliers or categories, just in terms of how this subcommittee thinks about where to focus. Yeah. Where can we have the biggest impact? Right, right. Um, I, I've done one before. Um, the date is old, but we're looking at updating it again. So that's great. Okay, maybe we can follow up with you. Yeah. All right. Uh, Nicole, David. Hey, Nicole. David, why don't you go first? Okay. Um, this came up a minute ago, but uh, is there a way for us to get um a view of the uh acquisition workforce um organizational structure um sort of how decisions are made and how the culture is influenced by a hierarchy through that organization i don't really have visibility to that but i would like very much to be able to see that uh, i think we can probably find resources about how we're structured your question about how decision making is like implemented throughout the acquisition. I mean, I guess there might be like there's formal designations. The, 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 the review process, uh, you know, you've got uh, analysts that are putting together deals. Someone has to review those to make sure that they were uh, approached uh, appropriately and so forth. Like that hierarchy for the review process and really. It's the same hierarchy that's going to shape the culture mm -hmm. in terms of what people know are, are important. Um, that's the hierarchy that I'm interested in seeing. Okay, so more like the contract internal controls for how our acquisitions are developed and implemented. Yeah, just a well, one it would be an organizational hierarchy, and then perhaps a flow chart of how the work gets done. I think for the first one, I don't know, Boris, if you have that available. Uh, the second request, David, I'm not sure. Uh, one challenge with that is that we do have different acquisition centers that I think there's probably some general ways that the acquisition process is done. I mean, we have probably similar internal reviews, you know, pre-solicitation, post-solicitation, um, compliance checks. Um, I don't know if we have anything documented available about that, um, but we can look to see if we do. Yeah, yeah we, I mean, this committee is focused down. on the workforce. So mm -hmm. having some sense for how the workforce is structured is pretty important in my mind to think about where, what angles of attack we might want to mm -hmm. kind of discuss. Yeah. Yeah. And, and David, I dropped the, the link to the Federal Acquisition Service site on the chat because that's a good place to start in terms of kind of understanding how the, the organization is set up. So that, that would be a good place to start, but we can definitely get more more information than that. That's just a starting point. Yeah. 
Brennan, I'd like to follow up on um, Boris's comment and uh, that you helped uh, pepper some flavor on to related to the complexity of the federal acquisition workforce. I'm really curious about what types of training you believe would be most needed. Like if we're gonna target our attention first, what is most needed to embed sustainability and environmental considerations into acquisition decisions? And should we be thinking about distinguishing different types of training for different classifications of federal acquisition workers? What do you see there? Yeah, training is tough. I Because uh, I've taken sustainable acquisition training where it's kind of like, like you don't, they don't need a deep dive into the science behind environmental impacts. Like there's a lot of stuff they don't need to know. Like some of that can be helpful as context, but it's more, they just want to know like, what do I need to do? Like, what do you want me to do and how do I do it? So uh, whenever we provide training, we kind of focus it at that level. Um, so let me rephrase my question. Yeah. What, what isn't happening at the moment that you think would be useful? As, as you're looking at opportunities on the horizon, what do you think would be most needed? Um, I feel like contract administration um, is probably the biggest gap. Because I mean, I think for the acquisition folks, they're gonna say, I have the clause, I put the clause in, like I follow the FAR, I have this acquisition, I did everything you asked me to do. You know, if we, the other things we're doing in terms of greenhouse gas disclosure, it's primarily been prompted and encouraged through leadership, um, but they're gonna, they're gonna stick with compliance generally if left to their own devices, which makes sense, right? Cause I think in their mind, introducing new things adds risk to the core acquisition, protest risk, halt. Um, it could and, and I think this also gets to the climate risk plans. You know, right mm -hmm. now it's sort of a checkbox effort. That's not going to be enough later on. So then clearly sure. we need to be thinking ahead towards, well, then how do you assess these plans? Yeah. And in, in some of the I, I think it's tough. Like, I guess for any in terms of like making the pitch for acquisition teams to do this, it's what's the value to them in the short term. Like, I do sense like a tension of we're pushing. We see this as value at an organizational brand level, climate risk level, but for them trying to just get their acquisition through, it, it doesn't. It just adds risk, uh, as as I said. So, I, I know I'm not answering your question. Um, in terms of what they need to know for education. I don't know, Nicole. So it's, okay. <laughs> it's okay, I'm gonna cycle back around at the end because I'd like to hear from you about what sort of individuals, based on our conversation today, who else should we be talking to? But I'm gonna pass the baton to Anne and, and put that sort of seed, that conversation of next folks for us to talk to, to help round out the picture here. Nicole, your questions are good. They're hard to answer. <laughs> um, I was thinking a little bit, Brennan, about uh, the area of green products and how you help the workforce prioritize the purchase of those products. And one thing I've found super impactful in the last few technology companies I've worked at is a, an exercise called Walk the Store, where we have a end user, in this case, it would be an acquisition professional, walk us through today from beginning to end how they find, a, how they search for a green product, how they find it and how they purchase it beginning to end. And we might think about having an acquisition professional walk us through a real live demonstration of that process through GSA Vantage and maybe through the e-commerce platform, a couple of them. Those are primarily for tailspin low dollar purchases. But mm -hmm. uh, I think doing that would give us a lot of insight into where we might do better. And I think the solutions are probably gonna be challenging because they'll probably require technology and investment, yada, yada. But I think we have to start with what is the experience today? 
Um, and before we go into what the solution is and how we improve it. So one thing the subcommittee might think about for the next meeting. I agree. I would uh, expand that too, because I think, as you said, like the, the volume of products pur purchased through Advantage is low compared yeah. to everything delivered and supplied through other contracts. Yep. So if there was a way to get them to walk through that for like, uh, we'll go back to like an alliance acquisition yeah. like did you have equipment delivered was it sustainable like i think both of those would be extremely helpful right we could probably come up with five different scenarios like okay so you have a contracted supplier and you punch out to their website what does that process look like mm -hmm. um you're right uh gc advantage yeah is yeah right it's just one channel through which people purchase yeah that's a great idea Um, I have a follow-up question to some things that I heard about the various plans. Um, are there, I'm wondering, are there other industries where you submit plans that, um, might be a model here? And I, I got to thinking about the construction industry where you have to submit QAQC plans or safety plans and, you know, the procurement or program manager uses various checklists to see if the, so it's not just a, you submit the plan and it's, and you're good, but you submit the plan, we read it and we evaluate it and we determine, you know, if it's uh, meeting certain standards and then you move on. So um, at, at some point we might want to dig into this idea of the, uh, the plan submittal. Yes. Yeah, so for client, yeah. So for the GHG disclosure, that one is fairly like quantitative, but I think you're Daryl kind of cut, talking about the climate risk one, which is kind of, right. there's no way to evaluate it right now. I think that kind of gets to what I was saying, like, how do we move from this subjective thing to something like we want suppliers that are managing their risk effectively. And how do we, how do we get there? Great. Um, Guys, I think we've peppered uh, Brandon with a lot of questions here. We, we truly uh, appreciate um, your presentation and maybe would like to have you back um, at some point. Um, any final questions? Yeah, I do want to circle back around either asking you, Brennan, or Melissa, your team member, about in other individuals who are in this space that you think would be useful for us to talk to moving forward. Be very eager to hear your thoughts. Do you, uh, what, Nicole, is there an area you're looking for, like an operational uh, acquisition person or someone who's been more at the policy level? Like, did you have a certain flavor in mind? One of the topics that we've discussed as a subcommittee relates to uh, the OPM review on trainings and where that is and what's happening within that space and where opportunities are. However, I mean, I really want to, I'd like to hear from you and Melissa about areas of opportunity that you think we should be paying attention to. For training or just in general? In general. I got some names. Um, well, do you want you them now? Can, you can yes. <laughs> you? Okay. Uh, so has, has Adina Torbenson talked to this committee yet? Not yet. <laughs> Okay. Okay. She, did, uh, she did address the uh, policy and practice uh, subcommittee on single-use yeah. plastic. So we've had a that, that was the cool committee. But anyway, go ahead. Oh, oh I see. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, humility, right? Their committee rivalry. <laughs> okay. uh, she she would be good. She's at the OGP level. Um, so in terms of and she runs or co-chairs the G uh, federal sustainability materials management work group. Uh, so. Uh, so some of these federal trends, it might be helpful to get away just from the fast perspective. Um, so she, so she would be someone good. Um, uh, oh gosh, what's that lady? Uh, Sue, uh, dang, I can't remember this person's name. Um, th there's some grizzled vets that, uh, have been around for a while that would love to unload on you guys about their frustrations. Um, I don't think. There's a, web, a website that says grizzled vets. 
<laughs> we do need names. <laughs> I'll let, let me think, Nicole, because I, uh, right. but I, I, I can if I have time to shoot an email to Boris to pass along, I can come up with a lot of different uh, names. Perfect. Thank you. And, and the same to you, Melissa. If, if other individuals pop up, please let us know. I have one final question. Sure. So earlier today, I believe Stephen sent us all a 2022 global review, and he also sent us some key recommendations from that review. And so one of them was uh, number three, advance all aspects of sustainability. So I'm curious to know how um, the federal acquisition sustainability procurement is going to evaluate um, equity, diversity, and inclusion. They say the organization should broaden the focus of sustainability procurement to advance all aspects and extend beyond the traditional uh, issue areas, such as wages and benefits, to new areas such as equity, diversity, and inclusion. And I was just curious how you are going, I mean, uh, what the evaluation process would be, or how do you determine how to evaluate equity, diversity, and inclusion. Yeah, thanks, Gail. Uh, there is a, GSA does have a plan, uh, a DEI plan. I'm not sure if you've seen it or not. I think it's publicly available. I'm not sure. Um, it's in terms of evaluation, I think that plan outlines a number of different steps that GSA is going to take to promote diversity, equity, inclusion. And a lot of that is really just making sure like, you know, for our acquisition vehicles, are we giving access to small disadvantaged different socioeconomic categories, making it easy for them to go through the evaluation process, not bombarding them with a lot of red tape. Um, once they're awarded, how do we help them succeed as a partner and get federal business? So I, I'm not an expert on that plan, but that's the kind of thing the plan addresses. Okay. And Boris, I don't know, that might be some, you can find that. Uh, I, I believe that's something that's accessible that you could probably find and share with Gail. Yes, definitely. And I can definitely track that down for sure. Thanks. Excellent. Again, Brent, thank you so much. And we appreciate the presentation and all the, the discussions and questions. And if you could send Boris that list of other names, that'd be appreciated as well. Sure. Thank you so much. It was great talking to you guys. Looking forward to what this committee comes up with. So thank you, Brent. <laughs> yeah, thank, thank you. You, Brent. you can go back to power washing your, your, your driveway. I think I'm done. Appreciate it. <laughs> Okay, um, on our agenda, I'm wondering if this is a good time for public questions. Daryl, would you like to open the floor up at this time for public questions and just ask anyone um, if they have any comment or suggestions at this time? Please feel free yes. to um, speak up. This, there seems to be no response at this time. Um, according to the agenda, um, you have your um, your mission statement and key priority discussions. Correct. So, given our discussion last week and at our admin uh, meetings. Just curious if there are any follow-up to finalizing the, the final um, mission statement and are any uh, priorities going forward? I'm, a, From, I'm, I'm happy, Daryl, to share my screen because I think we worked through a strong, a, a strong mission statement that we were hoping to get finalized on during this meeting and then uh, to move forward with finalizing it for the committee. So Correct. let me go ahead and share my screen. And you can, I'm hoping you can see. In blue is our uh, draft working mission statement. The notes still exist down below. I can, 
put, if you want to, because I'm not able to share it on my entire screen, I'll pop it in the chat, the place where the committee can look in the event that you want to see how this has moved along. But the draft mission statement is uh, to empower and equip the federal acquisition workforce to prioritize environmental outcomes and promote sustainability throughout the acquisition cycle. So really we're just looking for thoughts on how this is landing. It, um, we'd like to get this approved today. I like it. So do I. <laughs> Just one comment um, as I read through this and looking at the other ones uh, is just given our role mandate is, is it assumed or should we put in there in writing that it's to make recommendations to, you know, it's, we're actually making recommendations to GSA through the subcommittee. I don't want to get it wordy, but I just, or is it assumed? I guess that might be a question for Boris and Stephanie as we go through, because you're going to have these from all three committees. Yeah, I think safe to say that it is assumed because of the role of the advisory committee under the FACA rules is to provide advice. So, so you as a subcommittee will definitely bring everything to the full committee. And then the full committee makes the recommendations to GSA. So the, a long answer to your question, it is assumed. Uh, okay, Kristen. great. Mm -hmm. And same for the other subcommittees. So as I look at this and I think about our title, the Acquisition Workforce Subcommittee, I also go back to some comments that Brennan made about the acquisition team. I wonder if if we'd be more inclusive if we said the federal acquisition team. To, to Daryl's point, it is the far term of art, but it tends to not be what DAU and FAI use. Um, but I very much understand and agree with the sentiment, um, but I do think, and you know, Anne lived this for years, that there is no easy answer on this. Yeah. Right. I don't feel strongly one way or another, Daryl. I appreciate your point. I, when I see workforce, I do think that it includes program managers and cores and, but I, you know. Really? Welcome. Okay. I do, but I, I certainly welcome input from others of whether they think it's inclusive enough. I, I don't see any downside to team over workforce. Okay. There doesn't seem to be any general consensus. Well, this consensus is just to maintain the workforce and I guess I'm, I'm fine with that too. In the interest of moving on. Um, Okay, Nicole, I think we're there. I think we yeah. can submit this as, as our statement and um, Boris and Stephanie, we can move this on to our committee so, chair. So I, I would just add, um, since you do have a full um, uh, uh, subcommittee today, uh, if you could just please provide a show of hands that are in agreement with the mission statement and we can move forward from there. So if you can all get on camera, please. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or just raise your hand, use the icon. Raise your hand. Raise your hand. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> use the icon. Thanks, all. Right. Yeah, I, right. support, I can't find my hand. Yeah, me either. <laughs> <laughs> so I support. Reactions, under reactions. Good. Great. Yay. <laughs> all right. Okay. I think. The next area, Daryl, that we needed to talk about was our key priorities. And let me see. I, I'm sorry, I'm working off of a very small screen today. And so let me get to the right place and you tell me if you can see it. 
Have I transitioned over to the acquisition workforce subcommittee priorities? Yes. All right. The problem is my screen's very small, so I am just going to cut off our top so we can see what else is on here. And I will put this in the chat so you can go there directly if you choose. And I think the intention today is to really focus. We, we have a lot of great ideas here, but as, as we've been working with the other committees and thinking through how to focus our time, I think in reality, we're going to only be able to tackle a couple of these before our first level uh, recommendations in March. So if we're gonna really focus our attention, recognizing all of these items are important, where would that be? And Clyde has his hand up. If my hand is up, it was, I didn't lower it from the first question. I mean, uh, from the- um, Oh. <laughs> the vote. Yeah, from, from the vote, so I'm trying to lower it now. All right. <laughs> You're Is still it? welcome to talk to us, though, Clyde. <laughs> Clyde, I feel your pain. I feel it. <laughs> okay. I'm going to get this hand down in a minute. Um, is, is, it, is it still up? No. Okay. Again, this is about setting priorities. I wonder if it's if it might be one strategy to eliminate from this list what we think is beyond our ability to to tackle at this point, and then that would narrow our focus. There are, there are a couple of ways to do this. And you're right, eliminating the ones that we just say are out of bounds is, is a good start. Another approach is we just walk through each of these six priorities. And then as a committee, if we had top our top two votes, where would they go? And then we identify the, the two top vote getting categories as a place where we direct our attention. Can I make one suggestion? We just finished a mission statement. Mm -hmm. And I'd argue some of these are not consistent with our mission statement. So we just spoke about empowering the workforce through the entire acquisition life cycle. And number one speaks to evaluation criteria only. So is that consistent with our mission where we want to focus on the acquisition life cycle? The other comment I have is, I think we wrote these before of any, any of the presentations mm -hmm. and we've learned a lot. And I'm wondering if right. we should spend the next week refreshing these. And I wonder if we think about, we've heard again and again from the speakers, three focus areas, green procurement, sustainability, climate. If we think about focusing our efforts around one of those areas, that may not be the right answer, but that may be, or it may just be one way to cut or focus our efforts. Um, just a thought. I like and, that. And there's one, you know, green procurement is the most mature. Climate is the least mature. Another thing to consider. Any additional thoughts? I think just one other thought I would have as I look at the list, uh, and Ian, I agree with your comments um, that these were done first. So I think just giving the committee a chance to weigh in and um, put some additional thoughts is will be good. Secondarily, I think there's some that are kind of, I'm big into affinitizing, like there's a couple that are really kind of together. Um, so as we go through the list too, we can we can kind of, um, take a look at that. Like if you look at three, I think it's three, four, and six, you know, it's all about that equipping, um, how you train and develop equipping. So, and then, you know, once we get this list refined, we can kind of then 
work as a subcommittee to take it to, okay, what are some short-term, mid-term, long-term things we could do? Um, I like that. Um, Steve? So I, I want to apologize first that I don't want to be a driver on this committee's priorities because I have another committee. So that's number one. But having said that, and I, I, I feel pretty confidently that I am the, I, I don't want to say the, the most negative, but the least optimistic of the group. And maybe that's because I'm the most jaded in federal procurement. But it seems to me the single greatest victory that this group could achieve is anything that moves the needle, anything that pushes the bulk of the massive diverse workforce up the learning curve. And as a, a number of you know, um, you know, I've written, I've gone to conferences, I try to talk about vocabulary and concepts and thinking about it and talking about it. And so I, I hope that you aspire for great things. But if this committee can get federal procurement officials thinking and talking about it, learning the words, understanding why it matters, doing anything, and again, DAU, FAI, VAA, but the, the most basics, um, I would be incredibly impressed with what this committee had done. In other words, are you saying suggesting identify the low hanging fruit here? Uh, and, and and maybe, maybe so yes, but I think there is value added to simply introducing vocabulary and concepts and curriculum and topics. Um, as you heard, I pushed Brennan and I put in the chat. Until this is a core competency at FAI and DAU, we're not going anywhere. If this is buried in FAR Part 7 or FAR Part 23, it's not policy, it's background noise. But the biggest change, because change management is the elephant in the room. It's why OFPP used to publish Mythbusters memos. We need to get people to start thinking and talking about it. And my greatest fear is that the rule that is number one in line puts all the burden on the private sector and permits the 1102 community to ignore it for the foreseeable future. The second rule, we don't even have in draft yet. We're more than a year away. Once we get the draft, then we start training. Think about how impactful it would be if we could get people talking about it before then. I see Kristen's hand up, but before I go there, Steve, I just want to punctuate uh, the fact that what you have said here about the level setting and the key understanding across the federal acquisition workforce really is not reflected in these key priorities right now. So this really plays off of what Kristen was saying earlier about the notion that we've learned quite a bit since we've started this through our various conversations. And so I think it's important to look at this with a critical eye about whether we're sufficiently covering the areas that we believe today, not back in September, but today are most important. Yeah, I agree with that. And then Steve, as you were speaking, it made me think about, um, you know, my former life, you know, driving data and analytics into our organization and you know, there was this concept of improving the data dexterity of the organization. So, you know, meaning deeper understanding of data and how it can be used. And you could almost substitute in, um, you know, climate and sustainability uh, impact. So, you know, without increasing that general deeper understanding of what it is we're talking about, um, and even the acquisition team or workforce, you know, there's a natural barrier to progression, right? There's a lack of confidence. There's, um, uh, there's fear versus hope. So if we could, you know, make recommendations that really open up those floodgates as far as getting a very, uh, that getting that population to a higher level of understanding that could be foundational, you know, for this moving the needle type progress. 
So I guess what I said in a very long way is I like what you said. So thank you. <laughs> yeah, I think we just have to decide understanding of what. Is it green, sustainability, climate, all three? Yeah. Maybe it it might be worth setting aside our next meeting as a uh, a working session on on the list and refining this list. I know we're not going to. I think we've canceled our admin meeting next week for obvious reasons, but I but our next meeting could be maybe we could take a pause from presentations and actually focus on kind of working through what we've heard and refining some priorities as a group. Any thoughts on that? Yeah, totally agree, Daryl. Makes sense to me. And I'm, I'm, I'm really good with that too, Daryl. I would just ask the committee that we have homework between now and the next meeting, that we can't step into this without having thought about it personally. So I would ask everyone to reflect on what we've been hearing for the last several sessions. Take a look at what's here. Ask what isn't here that should be here. And then based on what we've heard, where the real pain points are, how we should be focusing our efforts, but between January and March, because that's not a lot of time. And, and so if we can, if, boy, if we could land on the same page January 3rd, I think that would be a huge, a huge win for us. Hey, Nicole, one, one clarification is we're looking at actually April before, so it would be more like January to April. So you got another month. <laughs> All right. All right. <laughs> yeah. No, but I did want to clarify. Yeah, plenty of time. Yeah. All right. <laughs> Yeah, tor yeah, but they, they want to clarify that towards the end of April is when we Thank will you. have the next meeting. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Kristen, well I see Kristen done. laughing. <laughs> you, woo -woo. <laughs> One suggestion as we think through updating these priorities, I think we should resist trying to write the solution in the priority. Yes. <laughs> we don't know that. We don't know. We don't know that yet. So just I think there's probably many different ways to think through how to prioritize, but the priority should be, yeah, it shouldn't be formulaic or prescriptive <laughs> yet. I yeah. agree. And so and you see my comment here, like develop and deliver effective curriculum. I don't know that we're ever going to do that. We can recommend areas of emphasis you know, building a toolkit. I don't know as a committee that we ultimately will end up doing that, but we can certainly offer recommendations. And certainly at this early stage, it's it's impossible to, to head down this path. Yeah, and, and given your comment, Anne, take for example, number five. I mean, how could we narrow that down to five words, you know, as opposed to the, a paragraph. And maybe it, it's all just it's identifying um, new technologies. I mean, maybe there's a way that we can. Yeah, that's just... right. And like, I wrote number two, but that's a that's a how that's not a priority area. So Right, right. And you may want to consider writing questions like uh, business questions, you know, what are what are questions that you want to try to answer as a subcommittee? And that's sometimes a good way to think through these. Yeah, or um, one fun thing we did at my prior company was like, what would the, when we announce it, what is it? What is the press release we'd write announcing what we've done for the workforce? And if you start thinking through like, well, how would you tell the workforce what, what we just launched? What would that be? And that may help us with our focus areas. So I, I agree with, um, and actually maybe we should pause again for any questions from members of the public who might be listening in. Okay, um, I agree with Nicole with the 
her point around some homework for our next meeting. I think uh, if we could just agree to bring uh, two uh, priorities or two questions or two um, ways that we might want to uh, address things going forward. Each committee member, we're a small committee, so I believe there are only eight of us. Uh, that would give us some additional material to, to analyze. We can do that as part of our, our workshop and we'll create that agenda for everyone to look at. And, you know, let's, let's be clear. We got some uh, busy days ahead of us next meeting um, with all the holiday stuff. So. Daryl, may yes. I ask a point of clarification? So I wonder with our homework, if we each personally reflect on the two areas based on what we've heard, the two areas yeah. we individually believe are important. And I am happy to set up a Google sheet and just drop them in because I think then we're gonna be able to shift stuff around, look at common areas. That may be uh, a, a way to help facilitate the process. I like it. Hey, okay. absolutely. I'm happy to yeah. Now I, you know, we can uh, iterate, which I like. I think we did a good job on that with some of the earlier work. Commission, and it also doesn't tether us to what's in this document right now. Okay. Right. That that was intended just as a starting point. It was not intended to be that the the old annals is just a starting point. Yeah. It was a good starting point for mm -hmm. us. Yep. Yep. But we've moved on. <laughs> That's right. you've, you've, you've gathered more information. You've learned more things in the in the meantime. And Boris and Stephanie, for those of us who aren't other who are not on other subcommittees, is there anything that we should be considering as a subcommittee that the other subcommittees are doing that might be helpful to our group? And Stephanie, go ahead. <laughs> no, I, I was gonna say you you have Luke and you have. Uh, He's on, and he probably could uh, make some suggestions, recommendations, if you open it up to the to the floor again for public. Yeah, and Kristen's here as well. And Troy and Cassius. Right. Yeah, I mean, I can just share with you, uh, you know, I, we're in the industry partnership subcommittee, Daryl, so we, we're kind of trudging our way through similar, uh, refining the mission statement, uh, looking at that initial area of focus, um, we're going to spend some time tomorrow uh, really going through that and kind of cleansing the list. I like the idea of giving the team another week or so to add because there is a lot more information. Um, so I would say we're in kind of a similar stance. We may try to use a collaborative tool tomorrow and we can let you know how that goes. Uh, uh, after the fact, it might be something that can help, you know, get get more folks kind of engaged and in interacting. Yeah, I agree. We're, we are in a similar state of, uh, you know, trying to chart a course that the uh, rest of the committee can buy into to deliver something useful and meaningful here. Um, I think we're we're getting there. Um, probably better coordination amongst us as a group in selecting speakers and kind of uh, finding a way to listen in on others, like you know what I'm trying to do here today and what Steve has done as well. Uh, I think to to you know collectively raise the IQ will help us get there. But I think we're all we're all essentially in the same place right here. Um, but do think right. we could all benefit from some closer coordination with each other. Good. Listen, are, are there any final thoughts or concerns um, given our time frame and where we are as a subcommittee? So I'm, one, I'm really opening up to anyone on, our, on the committee. Yeah, well, one thing I wanted to say that did bring in Troy and Cassius. Troy, I know you've been on a listening mode, but just I think it's appropriate if you had any comments right now as we're talking about integrating the group, uh, the work of the three subcommittees. I don't know if you had any thoughts to share. Troy, can you hear me? You are on mute. Right. Oh, okay. Oh, yeah. 
All right, did that work? <laughs> yeah, it works now. Okay, sure. Uh, okay, sorry about that. Um, well, I, I first wanted to just say congratulations on a really outstanding uh, agenda for today. I thought I thought Brennan was an excellent speaker and um, re really uh, help, helped us all understand uh, more about what GSC is doing and how they're trying to like connect policy to the uh, you know where the rubber meets the road. So I thought it was a, a great session um, and. Um, would just say, you know, just kind of looking across the subcommittees. I mean, first of all, I I think um, as, as as everyone's kind of noted, everyone's kind of in, in, in a little bit of the same place and um, trying to to refine their mission and priorities. But I also say they're all in the same place in that we just have outstanding subcommittee chairs and um, co-chairs who are just really putting in tremendous effort. Uh, to, to what they're charged with, and um, and beyond that, all the, the subcommittee members are are engaged. Um, I think we've we've had good attendance at the meetings, and I just really uh, appreciate that. This is a lot um, to take on, and uh, with each subcommittee, the the range of topics potentially we could take on is really astounding. Um, and so I just really appreciate what everyone is going through to try to hone this in and um, to ultimately make our, our committee's recommendations meaningful and actionable. Um, so thank you all. I, I, I think we all also are kind of at, um, as, as a committee as a whole, um, also realizing that yes, we, we've learned a lot over the last um, couple of months and uh, especially as the subcommittee meetings have cranked up the last few weeks, and I do feel like it's it's great for all of us to kind of step back and reflect, and for the subcommittees to to take notes. Um, so I I think we're in a uh, a good place, uh, recognizing that as I say that um, it it's it's a pretty broad scope of what we're looking at, and can seem a little daunting, but. Um, I, I think with with each and every meeting that we're making progress to learning more and figuring out where we can best target our efforts. And um, sorry, I had to join by phone today. Cassius, if you're on, I'd love to, to hear your thoughts. Hey, Cassius, you might be on mute. <laughs> Well, while we wait on Cassius Troy, could you also uh, outline any expectations that you might have for the subcommittees to present at the full committee meeting next month? Well, yeah, that, that's a great question. And I think um, that Boris and Stephanie and Cassius and I will be talking about this uh, after this next uh, this week's um, round of subcommittee meetings, but I think obviously we'll want to carve out time for each of the subcommittees to um, just give us a, a summary of their um, scope of inquiry so far. Um, I, I think by that time, like each of the subcommittees will have, have adopted their mission statements. So it'd be great to, to hear about that, um, hear about uh, progress thus far, uh, narrowing priorities, recognizing that, um, you know, certainly we're not closing the door to, to anything else that, that might come up. Um, and uh, it's just a general forecast over um, the, the next couple of months of, of, of what the, the focus of um, inquiry will be. Um, and again, Cassius, if you're on, love to, to Hear your thoughts, and and again, um, I think you know Boris and and Stephanie and Cassius and I will be uh, meeting to to kind of take stock of where we are and get more information out. But that's kind of my big picture view of how the next meeting goes. That's helpful. And it, it would be ideal if we can have whatever summary framework you guys um, want from us at the next, I think we only have one more subcommittee meeting before the full committee meeting.
Okay, if um, if we can't hear from Cassius, I guess, um, uh, again, any final comments or questions from um, uh, from the, the public before we move to adjourn? Any, any final comments, um, Nicole, or from? Um... Yeah, sure. I, I really just want to thank everyone on this committee. I, I, you, there's just a lot of commitment to what we're doing here, and it's felt. And I just want to express my sincere appreciation for all of the thought that you're putting into this. As my follow-up, I'll send out uh, in, in the next 30 minutes or so that Google Doc where you can start dropping in your top two priorities. And this will set us up between now and January 3rd. Of course, there's, there's time to do this. Take whatever time you need between now and January 3rd. But this will be the basis then for our next meeting together. And I'm, I'm really looking forward to, uh, to crossing that hurdle. I think it's an important one. And Daryl, I think your intuition is right to pause and ensure that we land this right. Perfect. Uh, you're absolutely right. There's plenty of time, although I have a look, I have one less day than you guys, apparently. And um, Boris, Stephanie. All right. Well, thank you, um, Chairperson Daniels and uh, Co Chair uh, Darnell. Although this is the second um, acquisition workforce meeting, this is the last public meeting for the year. Um, the next virtual acquisition workforce subcommittee meeting will be held January the 3rd from 3 to 5 uh, Eastern Standard Time. So at this time, Boris, um, I'll turn it over to you for any additional uh, closing remarks. No, this is uh, great. So this is a really good good time to spend here with you all and uh, seeing the uh, the storming and norming of the group coming together. Um, I feel like we're getting a lot of information. I think tomorrow um, I'll encourage you to attend the other meetings if you can. Uh, we have some good speakers tomorrow as well that are coming to Christian and Farad's uh, industry partnerships group. And I believe uh, Luke and Steve are going to be focusing a lot on priority discussion on Thursday. So I encourage you, you feel free to jump into the other meetings. Uh, if for some reason you're able, no, not able to uh, make the, there is a 5 p.m. cutoff for registering, you can always send me an email or me or Stephanie and we'll make sure that you get the link to the meeting. So that's not a problem. But uh, yeah, I, I, I commend you guys. Uh, you're really, um, um, you know, just as I'm thinking about here, I'm. As a DFO, there's there's just a lot of great content that's being put out there, and a lot of great questions that uh, I think will get us to, to where we need to go. But that's all I have. So back to you, Stephanie. All right. Well, we'd like to thank you all for your contribution and your involvement in this event, and a reminder to the public that the comments and suggestions can be submitted through regulation.gov. This meeting is now adjourned. Right. I wish thank you all a happy, you, Nicole, Daryl, happy holidays.